discuss about her husband, Vlad. Uh, Katerina, have you been able to be in contact with Vlad? Can you tell us anything about his situation in prison? So everybody, it's an honor for me to be with you on this day, uh, which doubles as a holiday uh, of Vishavanka and the day of remembrance uh, of the journalist. Russian Federation began a war not a year ago, but because of that, the Russian Federation began a war with the destruction of Crim from the Ukraine. And this war, which then continued with the death of thousands of lives in Donbass and the war in the region. The Russian invasion started not a year and a half ago, but in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea. And it continued uh, with thousands of deaths on Donbass and uh, that region. Ukrainian journalists, independent journalists at that time, 
face the great resistance and the opposition uh, from the Russian authorities that were on the territory of Crimea at that time. Однак ті журналісти, які залишилися вільні своїй професії, які залишилися вільні Україні, попри всі складнощі, вони продовжували працювати на території окупованого півострова. So this repressive machine uh, that was aiming in choking the freedom, uh, they actually destroyed independent journalism in Crimea. But Crimean journalists who have stayed faithful to the profession, to their professional responsibility to Ukraine, despite all the difficulties, uh, continued to work. І щоденна праця таких журналістів нагадувала і нагадує всьому світу, що про проблему Криму, про те, що Крим це частина України, і вони вірять, що що Крим обов'язково повернеться до складу України. And everyday uh, work of these people reminds the whole world about the problem of Crimea. Uh, and every day they remind the world that Crimea is part of Ukraine and that they believe that Crimea will be back uh, as the territory of Ukraine. І з власного досвіду, і з досвіду інших громадянських журналістів, ми бачимо, що Росія за роки окупації в Криму влаштовує все, що їй заманеться, без будь-якої відповідальності. And uh, during the years uh, under the occupation of Russia, since they have entered Crimea, we see that uh, the, op the occupational authority do their anything they want to. І виникає відчуття повної безнадії, тому що де факто в Криму і не було розслідувано ні одного злочину і жодне людина не було притягнуто до відповідальності. And we kind of have uh, the feeling of hopelessness because none of these crimes have been investigated and none of the guilty have been brought to uh, court for their actions. But thanks to the independent journalists, we know the names of uh, those perpetrators and the office of the prosecutor have already started working on such cases and uh, we have a number of them that are being investigated right now. І саме завдяки громадянським журналістам Генеральна прокуратура має докази, докази в цих справах, які були зібрані громадянськими журналістами в Криму. And thanks to those journalists, the Office of the Prosecutor General has actual evidence that they can use in uh, defending those cases and the case of Irina Danilovich, her case was, publi was publicated uh, just like my husband's. Uh, she was accused of transporting uh, ammunition or explosives. And uh, thanks to the international activity, those cases are also being highlighted. We are all aware that the war will end soon with our victory. Наша справа з Владиславом також закінчиться перемогою, коли він буде звільнений. We all hope that this war will be over soon with our victory, and me and Vladislav, we also hoping for our own victory. Я розумію, Владислав, що для нас це довгий шлях, і він тільки почався, але ми ним вже рухаємося. 
I understand that for me and Vladislav, it's a long journey, but we have already started that and we are moving on that journey. І ми переможемо, тому що на боці Російської Федерації тупа сила, а на нашому боці здоровий глузд, правда і справедливість. And we are going to win because uh, Russia has on their side only stupid force and we have uh, freedom and democracy and our spiritual Останок в день пам'яті жертв депортації кримсько-татарського народу я хочу подякувати кожному кримсько-татарському воїну, який захищає українську державу зараз на фронті. And uh, at the last I would like to thank every Tatar from Crimea who uh, is related to this holiday uh, of remembering the Crimean uh, deportation. And thank to every uh, Tatar soldier who is fighting right now, defending the freedom of Ukraine. Thank you, and thank you for your invitation, Pani So, uh, Katrina, thank you for that uh, moving description. Uh, we at the Washington Post and everywhere in the journalism community salute your husband uh, for his bravery and you for standing by him arguing his case so powerfully and we look forward to the day when he's back doing his work as a journalist. So I want to turn to Ambassador Makarovi, you're an extraordinary advocate for your country in this time of, of crisis. On this day when we remember the brutal uh, ethnic cleansing of Crimean Tatars from their homeland, I want to ask you to, to tell us what you know from your government uh, contacts about the situation in Crimea, I want to say in occupied Crimea today, about the suffering that its people are experiencing, and whether you think a resistance movement inside Crimea, uh, people who do not want to, to stand for this occupation, is, is going to be underway. Thank you. Uh, well, the resistance has been there since 2014. That's why we have so many people in prison in Crimea. That's why we have, unfortunately, so many people who disappeared and we're looking for them. That's why so many people are being uh, uh, specifically, you know, detained, tortured. That's why the Crimean Majlis, Crimean Tatar Majlis is prohibited so that people cannot actually gather together and uh, use uh, the, the institutional structures that have been there, and we specifically, uh, during the uh, peaceful time before 2014, did everything possible in order to allow uh, our brothers and sisters there to flourish, and also being part, being part of Ukraine, but also feeling that they can be Crimean Tatars while being Ukrainian, which is very important, because again, today is the day when we have to remind that, you know, they have been taken from their homes and driven thousands of kilometers from there into place they've never lived before. And, you know, this is one of the, this forceful transfer is one of the elements of genocide. And this is what Russians have been doing to Crimean Tatars in 44. And this is what they're doing to our children right now. And for which rightfully Putin and, and Lvova Belova are indicted and uh, uh, there is arrest warrant for them. But the situation in Crimea is very difficult now. We have seen horrible scenes from Bucha and from Izum, the places we were able to liberate. Now, that was months. We have seen horrible uh, photos, aerial photos, of the destruction of Mariupol. And that has been a little bit more than a year. Imagine living under occupation for eight, more than eight long years. Uh, our beautiful Crimea, which was a treasure and everyone dreamed about going there for summer in Ukraine. It's heavily militarized. The agriculture is no longer there when it used to be. The Ukrainian uh, 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 historical sites have been either destroyed, like for building this highway, you know, the Tavia, whatever they call it, uh, highway, or like Bakhchisarai Palace, which we all treasured, is been renovated by Russians, or it's been looted you know, so many museums have been looted, and thank God recently with uh, 
uh, customs and border control uh, orders here, we were able to catch some of the uh, artifacts which were stolen from Ukraine, some from the mainland Ukraine and some probably from Crimea. And we try, we're, they were trying to sell them here in the US and thank God the border control did excellent job and they're giving it back to us so we can return it back home. So it's, it's you know, we cannot rest until we win and until Crimea is liberated. Only then we will be able to free all the people, fight for all the people who are imprisoned illegally in, in Russia, because again, I want to remind that some people who were illegally kept uh, captured in Crimea or in prison are serving their sentences in Russia. So when we win, the work is not going to be over. That's why the international tribunal and courts and everything is, is so important. But also then the healing process can start. And then a lot of work should be done in order to not only rebuild Ukraine, including Crimea, but also to, um, I will still, you know, and my president sometimes steals uh, your president quote, to build back better. We have to build something more innovative. And that innovative new Ukraine should be, you know, should include Ukrainian culture, but Crimean Tatar culture, which is inseparable, again, part of, of, of who we are. And then we all can go to Crimea and eat some great chibureks there, and hopefully Vlad will be with us on that trip. So, uh, Build Back Better is a wonderful thought uh, to take away. Uh, we want you to win your war first. Um, so I want to turn to, to Jamie Fly, who runs Radio Free Europe, who was Vlad's boss uh, at running uh, that organization. And Jamie, if you can tell us a little bit about the work that Vlad and other Crimean uh, journalists did, the risks that they took, uh, and then talk more broadly about what your journalists, who are often in the most difficult places, are doing to present information that we need to know from areas that often are closed. Well, thanks, David. Uh, and it's uh, good to be here with you. And thanks to the ambassador for hosting this. And thank you to Katharina, who I first met under fortunate circumstances two years ago. And she continues to amaze me. Um, with her advocacy on, on behalf of Vlad. I know she's traveled a long way uh, to be here with us this week. So we're, we've been committed ever since 2014 at Radio Free Europe to providing news and information from all parts of Ukraine, even those that are occupied by Russian forces. Um, we've dedicated significant resources to doing specialized reporting projects focused on Crimea, uh, focused on Donbass, uh, because, and we've seen this again now, uh, in recent, in the last 15 months, the Russian strategy has consistently been when they move into areas and occupy them to shut down media, to target journalists, to deprive the local population of uh, sources of independent information. And there have been chilling reports even in recent months about this playing out. Uh, as parts of Ukraine, like Kherson, were liberated, and the stories that the population would talk about, about what they were left with in terms of the radio broadcasts that they could hear, spouting pro-Kremlin propaganda as Russia tried uh, to dominate the information space. So we feel it's very important to invest in independent reporting. Um, we have plenty of brave journalists like Vlad who have been willing to take great risks We've had, unfortunately, journalists who, like Vlad, have also paid significant price, including several of our journalists who were detained in uh, Donbass, several of them for a few years before we were able to get them released with the support of President Zelensky as part of prisoner swaps. What Vlad was doing was basically reporting the facts about what life was like in occupied Crimea but also, he had colleagues who continue to work on this project who are providing factual information about what is happening in the rest of Ukraine to ensure that there's a linkage uh, because the Russian goal is to disconnect Crimea and the population from the rest of Ukraine, to deprive them of truthful information about what is going on in Kyiv and Ukrainian politics, what is going on now with the 
war. And so we, every day, in multiple languages, the Crimean audiences, are committed to providing uh, that factual information uh, to uh, audiences in, in, in Crimea. And also still trying to report about what's happening in Crimea, although given the challenges that we've now faced with Vlad's experience, that has become incredibly difficult to get independent information uh, out of Crimea, but it's something that we're still working on. We're still relying at times on our audience in Crimea to share tips and to share information with us, and it's something that we will uh, not stop doing un until that day when the, the occupation uh, ends. The final thing I'll just say initially is the sad thing about Vlad's case for me is uh, it's not singular at all, and other cases were already mentioned, but even at Radio Free Europe in the last several years, uh, I have two other of my staff who are uh, in prison. Two, the other two are in Belarus, Ihar Losik and Andrei Kuznetsuk. Uh, we've seen globally a huge increase in the number of journalists who are imprisoned uh, who have been killed as well. just about a year ago in a missile strike in Kyiv, and so the threats against journalists by authoritarians like the Putin regime are significantly increasing. In many respects, I think you can argue that Putin led the way. Uh, there have been concerns about his regime's targeting of individual Russian journalists inside Russia for years, and the assassination of journalists in Russia uh, who were willing to expose corruption and expose the truth about Putin as the consolidated power. And now this has gone global, and there are far too many authoritarian regimes that are adopting the Putin playbook uh, rather than learning that there are repercussions when you target journalists. Um, and so we will continue to advocate for Vlad's release, and we hope that uh, in the not too distant future that he'll be able to reunite with Ekaterina and some of his daughters is also with us. So uh, we're grateful in the news business for the work that uh, RFP journalists and all journalists in these closed places do to keep uh, information going. I'm always struck when I travel overseas at how many young people at great risk want to tell the truth. Uh, and you can say to them, you're, you're, you're risking prison and worse, and they do it anyway. So there's something wonderful in the human spirit. So I want to turn back to Katerina. <coughs> Katerina, your husband uh, testified that when he was in prison at first, and forgive me, but uh, we want to talk about this because it's so disturbing, that he was tortured to extract a false confession. Do you have any information about his condition now? And what can we in this audience do to be in solidarity with you and with him? Ну, ми всі можемо допустити, що знаходження російських в'язниць не додає здоров'я нікому. I think that we all understand that nobody gains help being in Russian prison. Всі 100% політичних в'язнів піддаються тортурам, фізичному та моральному тиску зі сторони ФСБ. The whole 100% of political prisoners are being tortured and they are under moral pressure from uh, the Russian ФСБ. І в перший час до, до цього ще потрібно додати відсутність спілкування з рідними, тому що політичних в'язнів ізолюють від суспільства, від новин і від всього, що відбувається на круги. And at the same time, lack of communication with their with their families because political prisoners are being isolated from uh, news, relatives, or the world around them. А далі лише одна задача перед людиною у в'язненні це вижити. And then the person who is being incarcerated has only one goal to survive. Наша задача як великої української родини підтримувати цих людей. Ми 
Я за те, що як жінки передавати ліки, харчі, необхідні засоби гігієни, задача суспільства – підтримувати людину і давати їй знати, що її чекають, що вона потрібна, що вона не забута, що вона не одна. And we, as a, his Ukrainian family, have to provide uh, him with support. Me, uh, being his wife, uh, I should be responsible for passing medication, food, and uh, the personal hygiene items. And we, as a community, we should provide him with uh, moral support. Я завжди радію і безмежно вдячна, коли до мене дзвонять і пропонують провести ще одну акцію по Владиславу, ще одну прес-конференцію для того, щоб нагадати суспільству і дати знати йому, що ми тут про тебе пам'ятаємо. I am very happy uh, to receive a phone calls or communication from organizations that uh, suggest to do another uh, event or press conference to remind the society about his case and uh, him uh, being still being captive. Зараз коаліція українських правозахисних організацій проводить акцію листи ув'язненим в Крим, і я дуже вас прошу, закликаю долучитися до цієї акції, написати просто привіт, ми тебе пам'ятаємо будь-якому політичному в'язню, який вам подобається, або всім разом. І це ви, ви просто не, не, не знаєте, ну, і не, не потрібно вам це знати на власній шкурі, як це в сірій холодній камері отримати звістку з теплими словами з волю. Коаліція правозахисних організацій. І зараз коаліція advocating organizations is doing their actions, which is uh, doing their event, which is called uh, Letters for Prisoners. And I would like uh, to invite all of you to join uh, this event and write a letter of support, because you can't even imagine how it feels when you are alone in that uh, dark gray cell and you receive a letter that simply states that we are with you, we support you, stay strong. Так, і на, наша задача одна – бути сильними, допомагати ЗСУ і е, потрібно досягти одну мету – це звільнення всіх окупованих територій України, збереження територіальної цілісності і суверенітету української держави і повернення всіх депортованих, е, незаконно депортованих українських громадян додому і всіх політичних в'язнів. And uh, I would remind you that we need, we, st we need to remain strong and remember our main goal is uh, not only the victory but also liberation uh, of Ukraine, uh, the returning the territories uh, of Ukraine and returning all our political prisoners and uh, anybody who had been held in captivity. So uh, thank you. That's a powerful uh, statement that we'll, we'll all remember. So, Madam Ambassador, when we hear uh, statements like uh, Katerina's, when we think about the suffering of the Crimean people in 1944, since 2014, when we think about, about the kidnapping of Ukrainian children from occupied areas, when we think of the photographs that we've seen from Bucha and Mariupol, know that these are war crimes. And so we ask ourselves, how will people in Russia be held to account? I've heard your Prosecutor General, Andrei Kostin, speak about that, but I want to ask you as the ambassador, how soon might this process of accountability begin? How will it begin? And what can we do again to, to know about and, and help you in this process of holding people? Thank you. Um, th that process already began. So uh, the, our prosecutor general, and again, I think this war is different from other wars, that we're not waiting until the end of the war or until we win to start working on justice. 
So prosecutor general already opened more than 85,000 individual cases, either on war crimes or related to war crimes. And they have been prosecuted, and some people not only indicted, but already are in prison in Ukraine, those who were able to capture. Those who are not, we are trying them in absentia. Ukrainian legislation provides such an opportunity. And we have, unfortunately, plenty of evidence, uh, not only from uh, the people, but also the videotapes and everything else. As you know, you know my uh, hometown, just to the north of Bucha, has been under captivity and after liberation, you know, uh, this is this is what we have seen, we have found, and uh, people have been prosecuted, those who are responsible for these horrible crimes. Now, there are more than 24 countries now, in addition to Ukraine, that started their own criminal investigations. And Ukraine is sharing a lot of information with these countries, and we are encouraging our partners to take, especially some of their, uh, you know, large cases, because again, we're doing as much as we can, but our system is really busy at, at the moment with all these cases. So we are asking our partners where I would like to take, for example, killing of prisoners of war in Olenivka, a, a horrible war crime committed by Russians, or other uh, situations like this, we are ready to share and we're sharing the evidence. Now, US is helping us a lot. You have heard from Undersecretary, but the support from the Department of State and from the Department of Justice on working with the, working with the, uh, gathering the evidence, uh, helping our prosecutors, uh, you know, building institutional capacity is really big there. We have also reached out, and we have cases in all major international courts. The International Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice, and the European Court of Human Rights. The only missing element is the tribunal, the International Tribunal for the Crime of Aggression. So I would say, you know, and again, for President Zelensky in his peace formula, the 10-step peace, peace formula, justice is a very important element of that. Justice now, that's why we're investigating. Justice tomorrow, justice as long as it takes. You know, we know that some of the cases will take time. But again, all of that, and I just want to repeat what Katerina said, and. Um, the goal now, and we have to keep focus as well. We have to do everything at the same time, but we have to keep focus. The goal is to win, and the goal is to free as many people as we can, as soon as we can. Because every day in prison, or every day under occupation, is a day of torture. So that's why, you know, usually you hear me talking about weapons, weapons, weapons. Because weapons and sanctions is the two areas where we all together have to double down in order to be able to liberate faster, in order to be able to free. And then justice, which already is you know, uh, in the motion, will be easier to, to achieve, but we have to get people back. Jamie, I, I want to ask you a question people often ask me, and, and that is, how can the world uh, help the Russian people get more information about their government, about what's happening in Ukraine. The, the idea that Russia will be a closed place in which information is essentially strangling uh, and, and people will no longer have the ability to uh, know what's going on and to act on it is one of the most frightening aspects of this. Crisis. Radio Liberty has been struggling in every way it can. Tell us about the situation now, about things that you can do in the future. This, this process is going to take a long time. And Russia's need for real information will only grow over time. What are you going to do about it? The important thing to highlight there, because we operate in 27 languages, um, we have about 150 journalists in Ukraine. And that number is actually growing since the start of the full-scale invasion as we expand our operations. And the work that they're doing uh, is not just to serve the Ukrainian people uh, through Ukrainian language content or to reach Crimean audiences or those in the east of Ukraine. Uh, another important part of their reporting is actually to provide the facts for the rest of the globe, for Russian citizens who we can then translate that content that was produced in Ukrainian, make it available in Russian, 
share it, though, even well outside of the 23 countries that RBRL operates in, the audiences in Africa, South America, the rest of the world, where Russian narratives about Ukrainians, about President Zelensky and his government, uh, are unfortunately taking hold. And so our brave Ukrainians, like Vlad, are really serving multiple purposes in terms of the audiences that they are reaching on a daily basis. Some of the things that our Ukrainian journalists are doing right now very much relate to the war crimes investigations. They're doing hard-hitting investigative reporting using uh, information they get from governments, but also open source information, satellite imagery that we can get from commercial sources uh, to help document for eventual investigations the war crimes that have been committed. We've even had cases where we've had our teams of Ukrainian journalists working in Ukraine who partner with some of our Russian national journalists who have been expelled from Russia, now have given up everything, given up their lives, are now having to live outside of Russia because they're persecuted by the Putin regime. And the two teams are able to do amazing reporting together, taking information that they've gotten from sources in Ukraine and our Russian journalists using their knowledge of uh, the Russian military, of Russian social media, are able to directly confront the perpetrators of war crimes and call them on the phone and get them in some cases on the record admitting their complicity, which has been astounding, some of the reporting that they've done uh, jointly. And so uh, through those efforts, uh, we hope to reach more and more Russians. I know there's a debate in Ukraine about uh, the utility of some of that and about whether we should even think that Russians can be persuaded at this point. I'll just say the facts that we have over the last 14, 15 months, our audience right now uh, is higher in Russia than it's ever been. Uh, which is saying a lot because we've been operating in Soviet, uh, first in the Soviet Union, then in Russia for 70 years. More Russians have been coming to our content since the start of the full-scale invasion than were coming before. And that's in an environment where our websites are blocked, our bureau has been closed. Uh, we've had, where we went from having hundreds of journalists on the ground to now, I'll just say, scores of journalists on the ground. We have more Russians who are engaging with our content. Is it enough Russians? No way. Uh, there are far too many Russians who have been brainwashed and will not engage with factual content. Uh, but we have seen, we have been somewhat optimistic in the sense that we've seen Russians use VPNs, seek out factual information about the conflict, and so we're using every technological means possible to get factual reporting in front of Russians wherever they are, whether they're still in Russia or whether they've left Russia as well, as many Russians now have and are moving around to of the world, and although it's, I don't think is often understood, that is very much a joint, at RFB, a joint Ukrainian-Russian project with also brave Russian journalists who have suffered immensely because of their work uh, and now are no longer able to call Russia home because of their commitment to their journalism. I must say that's the most hopeful thing I've heard in a while, that Jamie's audience in Russia is bigger now than it ever has been. Um, good, good for you. Uh, I hope it grows and grows. So we're getting uh, near the end of the time that we allotted. We're going to turn to you for questions in a, in a few minutes. Before we do that, I want to ask first to Katerina and then Ambassador Markarova if, the, if there are some last thoughts they want to offer on this day when we thank Katerina about Crimea. Uh, if there's you can give us about that beautiful place um, and uh, just a, a way we can all think about it uh, and the, the world that your husband bravely tried to describe. I, I think that would be very meaningful. Um, не говорили лише про погані явища в своїх інтерв'ю і не вишукував лише погане в Криму. Тобто він не говорив об'єктивно, показуючи дві сторони. I want to say that my husband, uh, being a journalist, was not only talking about negative events in Crimea. Uh, being a journalist, he was showing both sides, uh, negative and positive. 
рухаємося перемоги на Україні, ніхто з цього не сумнівається. Майже кожна українська людина колись відпочивала на Кримському півострові. Crimea is the pearl of Ukraine, and nobody has any doubt about that, because almost every family uh, who lives in Ukraine have uh, had their vacation on Crimean Peninsula. And there is no other solution to uh, the Crimean Peninsula's problem but to fight with it with uh, weapons in our hands because <coughs> Russia has never understood anything else but the brutal force. And uh, under no circumstances you should accept the annexation of Crimea and our victory should end with the total liberation of Ukrainian territories. So I, I want to ask uh, Ambassador Mark Robin, this is our last question before we go to, to questions. Um, pretty much this, the same thing. Americans, including some quite senior officials, sometimes say that the liberation of Crimea now is unrealistic. How would you answer them? I would say it's difficult, but it's inevitable. In 2000, in 1991, 92% of Ukrainians voted to be independent, including in Crimea. In 2004, Ukrainians voted for the European choice, and we fought an orange revolution when it was stolen from us. In 2013, we fought for the European future again, including in Crimea. The war against Ukraine started in Crimea, and our victory will only be complete if Crimea is back. It's no different from anything else, and I think our president has been very clear since the day he was elected, since Crimea was so important for him that in 2021, uh, when we celebrate the 30th uh, anniversary of Ukraine's independence, specifically on that, uh, anniversary celebrations we started the Crimean platform. We Ukrainians used eight years to uh, to use any diplomatic solution possible in order to restore sovereignty and return Crimea back through peaceful measures. And Russians used all the time to gather the weapons to attack us again. And I think it should be clear for all of us, any operational pause, any unjust or unfair compromise, will only be a pause before the new war. This is our historic chance to win. Us as Ukraine and liberate all Ukraine, but all of us as democracies. And, you know, we should not um, look for, um, you know, false kind of solutions, but we should just see it for what it is. It's a brutal aggression. The Crimea referendum is no different from all the fake referendums that was done under the guns in other oblasts. We just have to stay the course. And as the previous 15 months has shown, we can do this. We can win. And we just have to, all of us, stay united, stay focused. And, um, you know, Crimea will always be Ukraine. Thank you, Ambassador. So I want to turn to the audience. If you have questions for any 